TLO, what's poppin'? Who's that? That's me. <laughs> yeah. um, we are on Twitch. We are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. And if you don't know, you should know. I hit 10,000 followers on TikTok. Um, I don't know, man. I always say celebrate the little the little things. So I'm celebrating. 10,000 not little to me, but celebrating. <laughs> uh, links down in the description. Uh, for this page as well, the Lit One Live, if you miss any live broadcast, they'll be on here. And then we got the Discord as well. And we got Patreon. Patreon really be making it move, man. Patreon keeps the dream alive. You know what I'm saying? So if you want to be a Patreon member and show some type of love uh, monetarily, you know, just be a member of Patreon. Simple. Let's get into this, though. HMP Whitemore prison documentary. This dropped 14 hours ago. This is the first time I'm watching a documentary within, like, the first year of it being out. <laughs> a prison one, at least. Let's get into this, man. Behind bars. Escape from prison. You better hope you don't end up here. In the belly of the beast within the prison. If you're ever sentenced to life and you're planning to escape from prison, you better hope you don't end up here. In the belly of the beast within the prison system. Welcome to Britain's Alcatraz. It was designed to be impregnable. It was somewhere you'd never escape from. Here, you'll be locked up with some of the most fearsome criminals in the prison system. Serial killers, serial rapists, contract killers, drug lords, the IRA. You'll be rubbing shoulders with gangland bosses and armed robbers. You're a different class of prisoner. You're kind of uh, above the hoi polloi. And coming face to face with murderous extremists. The purpose of taking him hostage was to murder him. Probably by beheading. You may even end up in the prison's impenetrable special security unit. It's sterile. You're locked in a tomb. It's very, very daunting. You'll be kept in line by prison guards. Right. You are connected with men start. inside. Is easily be the actual of a bit of it. Come to bring built on the 94. Built on the 90. We don't watch intros or previews. Four acre site of an old railway yard in the middle of the remote fens in Cambridgeshire. This is HMP Whitemore, one of Britain's newest high security category A prisons. Oh, it's new. It's a newer one. So that's why they're so confident that nobody can break out of it. They always be confident until somebody actually does it. A new breed of prison, designed to contain a new breed of prisoner. When you got told you were going to Whitemore, your heart would stop. It is extremely imposing and oppressive, and you can feel the whole of the prison system coming down round on you. You think, God, I'm in a dungeon here, in the belly of the beast within the prison system. Opened in 1991 at a cost of 58 million pounds, Whitemore was seen as the long-awaited son. 1991 is pretty new. That was only 22 years ago. Some of y'all not even older than 22. That's crazy. Lucian to modernizing a prison system struggling with a surge in prisoner escapes. It was designed to be impregnable. It was somewhere you'd never escape from. Whitemore is, you could say, is at the start of a new generation of high security prisons. This high-tech concrete fortress was built to replace Britain's crumbling Victorian prisons and designed to contain the most challenging criminals of all. The layout was given much more thought in terms of the space inside the prison and how staff could control that space and maintain order. So the prison was constructed deliberately to cope with a uh, cohort of very dangerous, uh, often very violent, and manipulative uh, prisoners for whom escape ought to be made uh, impossible or as close to impossible as, uh, as could be. In 1987, the most audacious... He didn't want to use the word possible again, I heard it. He was like, or as close to impossible as possible. They don't, yeah, you're right, don't sound right, but anyway. As could be. In 1987, 
the most audacious escape attempt in prison history was made when a hijacked helicopter was forced to land inside HMP Gartry and two inmates were able to board and get away. The MOJ vowed this could never happen again. I'm not gonna lie, I've never heard nothing like that before in my life. Rolling hijack the helicopter to get the guys out, that's tough. <laughs> That's real GTA. What you will see there that would um, probably contrast with some of our other uh, prisons is first of all the physical uh, defences. Uh, high walls with escape proof beaks at the top. You've got razor wire, you've got fences that have got electric probes on. There is a, a huge amount of closed circuit television cameras. Probably fair to say it is one of the most surveilled pieces of real estate in Western Europe. Beyond Whitemore's imposing walls, razor wire and CCTV were constructed four of the securest residential wings in the prison. I hear y'all. The technology is there in the prison. Is the staff there though? You can have all of this technology to keep people in, but if the staff is incompetent, people can escape. <laughs> and system. Each wing has three caged off living areas called spurs. That's where you'll be spending most of your time. The purpose was to break the secure area within the prison wing. Because down into smaller, manageable groups. If you want a member of staff in Whitemore and you go down to the end of your spur, you have to shout through the bars. Gov, gov, and wave to the office and they'll see you and come and talk to you through the bars. Unlike normal prisons where they just walk along the landings, they don't in Whitemore. There will be remote access that will be controlled by a control room far away from the, the, the site of the wings. And the reason for doing that is that parts of the prison could be completely sealed off. So you restrict, 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 restrict. Reduce movement, reduce contact with other inmates. Very severe. As well as the escape proof wings at Whitemore. That's good, because I think the last one I watched it is. They had the control room and they got them real comfortable. Was that this? And they escaped in the, in the van, the work van or something? There's an even more impregnable prison block. It was for category A inmates who posed the most serious security risks. And it was known as the SSU, the Special Security Unit. Which was a prison within a prison. So it's got its own wall, its own fences. And then outside of that, it's another wall and another fences. Um, and then that's the mainstream Whitemore. Whether you're heading to the wings or the SSU, traveling to Whitemore for the first time is a daunting experience. With a helicopter above, armed police, but go around roundabouts the wrong way and down uh, motorways flashing people. As you approach the prison, you just see that huge wall looming up in front of you. The screws are aggressive there. As soon as you get there in reception, they're just on it straight away. There was three Alsatians waiting for me and a sea of prison officers. You get strip searched straight away. Searches are very demeaning and I've had searches bring me to tears nearly. Bollocks up, cheeks parted, show the cheeks of the arse, but squatting was just to humiliate you. And then they call you out one by one to like, process your property, take your photograph, give you an ID card. And you take them to whichever wing you're going to. Be given a cell, given a mattress, pillar, it. some bedding. They said the strip search, the, the strip search was brought them to tears. It's like a prostate exam times six or something. Oh, tough. And banged up. Locked, the big door slammed behind you. And that's you. You're in the jungle. It's your first night at Whitemore, and you'll be bedding down with some of the most feared criminals in Britain. It houses offenders of the worst kind who are not afraid to use violence. For example, it was home to Kenneth Noy, the M25 killer. It was home to Paul Massey, who was Mr. Big in Salford. Where well, you had uh, Big Smack Robbers, 
Mickey Steele, Essex boys. You also had uh, the Dome Robbers, Billy Cockrum and uh, Aldo. It has a group. Billy Cockrum. And... You okay? Somebody got that eye. You'll be all right. And uh, Aldo. It has a group of gangsters, but it also has separately a substantial group of terrorists, including, for example, Ushman Khan, who uh, died on London Bridge at the Fishmongers Hall attack. Whitemoor opened as a state-of-the-art flagship Category A prison. It was designed to keep the public safer than ever, but there were problems from the start. There was a pressure on them to get it open quickly, and so it wasn't as well staffed nor as well planned. See what I'm saying? When it, it don't matter. Staff is going to be the out ending tale of everything. As it should have been. I think the mistake they actually made was they went to the segregation or punishment units in the, in, in the dispersal system and emptied them and moved all the occupants, myself included, to Whitemore. In 1991, the first intake of some of the most dangerous and high-risk Category A inmates were transferred to Britain's newest prison. I come there with a reputation, I just escaped from a maximum security prison. And a much stricter regime awaited the new arrivals. You know, we were lined up in the reception area and told by our governor that what we'd experienced and only in other dispersal prisons wasn't going to happen there and that they were in charge. The prison establishment and the Prison Officers Association saw the creation of Whitemore as an opportunity to reset the lines, if you like, and re-establish themselves as being the ones in total and absolute power. But inmates like Paul believe that some of the new prison officers hadn't worked in a Category A establishment. Staff, apart from the very senior staff, would... That's crazy. They built a high-tech security system, I mean, a high-tech secure prison and went and, and, and hired GameStop employees again. Like, <laughs> leading people at ASDA. Totally inexperienced. They had no idea how, basically, to run a maximum security prison. The general relationship between the prisoners and the staff was one of mutual hostility. Inevitably, there was gonna be problems there. Unhappy with staff and the new restrictive conditions, Whitemore's Category A inmates quickly united and began a campaign for change. Everybody refused to work. And their response was to operate a total lockdown. So whilst locked within ourselves, we would bang on our doors, destroy all the furniture in our cells, and then they knew that they couldn't regain control. The balance of power, as within three weeks, shifted in our favour. <laughs> oh, hey, they had the prison open three weeks, and it was shifted. The power was shifted. All that talk, and they hired incompetent employees, like I said at the beginning. Britain's newest maximum security prison was on the brink of being taken over by its inmates drastic action was needed. They brought in riot squads, and we were each individually taken from our cells, placed into vans, and moved to other establishments or prisons. Waking up in HMP Whitemore, you'll have spent the night in a cell alongside some of the most disruptive and dangerous inmates in the prison. Yeah, I can imagine y'all put too many, too many dangerous, hot-headed, non-compliant people in one prison they ain't going for that system one category a prisoner doing time here was gary johns sentenced to life for stabbing a man to death at a party in 1993. i was inside 28 years i was in whitemore for two years for some prisoners in the 80s and 90s escaping was a very real possibility and so the prison service came up with a plan to try to foil any more escape attempts in the prison service, there's such a thing as the E-list, 
which identifies prisoners who are, in particular, in danger of trying to escape. They are asked to wear specific clothing and are given enhanced security. White Mod just locked it off for me because I was an E-man and all. I come there with a reputation, I've just escaped from a maximum security prison. This is the suit. Uh, the start was good enough to let me keep it because they said I had it on more times than I did. And they say it's for security so they can pick you up on camera everywhere you go. I was in one of these for nearly two years, on and off. If you're on the E-list, you would be under a stricter regime than the rest of the inmates, with fewer privileges and more restrictions than other Category A prisoners. It almost assumes a form of cycle. Yeah, they, this type of prison can't have nobody escaping. That's, that's embarrassing. They made it specifically for it. School torture, being on Category E. You're escorted by a prison officer who all your movements are monitored in a little small book that he holds. I spent about two years on that, which was probably the worst two years of my entire sentence. Yeah, they take all your clothes of a night, they take your knife, fork, you've got no way of digging out. They even take the suit, they make you wear pajamas. Being on the E-list would even affect an inmate's only chance at connecting with their old lives on the outside. Every visit you come off a of white moil, you get strip searched. Every visit, every time you, you have contact with the outside world, you're strip searched. As strict and oppressive as being on the E-list was, you were still housed on the open wings. But being an E-man like, had nothing on the newest. I feel like in America, they strip search you on every visit too. My, my, uh, my stepdad, he was in prison for eight years. And, and I feel like every time we went to go visit him, he was strip searched. Mm. A most secure unit ever built in the prison system. Whitemore's SSU. The special secure unit within Whitemore had 10 cells. It has since expanded to 30. I suppose you'd call it a prison inside a prison, a prison within a prison. The SSU housed Category A prisoners who were deemed an exceptional risk and who posed a danger to the public, prison staff and even to other inmates. The regime for prisoners in the SSU, um, you have to understand that the SSU was nicknamed the submarine by prisoners because it was that oppressive. It was a very, very small, self-contained unit. It is actually like uh, a very miniature prison wing. This is the gymnasium. This is the hobble, hobbies room. TV room, association area, and exercise yard is got to be outside. Built separate Very to the small. rest of the jail with its own perimeter wall, with its own fences, its own cameras. There wouldn't have been any moment where they weren't on camera or they weren't being physically monitored by officers. So the the actual security, probably from a, a prisoner's point of view, would have been absolutely oppressive. But it wasn't just the vast amount of CCTV cameras that made the SSU so impregnable. So to escape from the secure unit in the prison, you would need to breach the first chain link fence, climb the inner wall, breach the second chain link fence and breach the outer wall. A considerable achievement and would require a great deal of ingenuity. In the early 90s, there was one group, Three walls. group of high profile prisoners contained at Whitemore who posed a very real threat of attempting to escape. They were sent straight to the SSU. The Irish Republican Army. Ah, uh, yeah. Didn't they escape from somewhere else already? So. Were Republicans in Northern Ireland who believed that the British were occupying Ulster. This was long before 9-11 or 7-7, long before Islamic terrorism. First established in 1919 to end British rule in Northern Ireland, the IRA fought for independence and a unified republic. It waged an increasingly violent campaign across Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, 
and other parts of the UK. The British what is this? The first ever machine gun? The army retaliated, and this period known as the Troubles lasted nearly 30 years until the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998. They classed themselves as prisoners of war, so they behaved accordingly. And under the, prison, under the Geneva Convention, their duty as prisoners of war is to escape. It's not, you know, you don't ask, they have to escape, and the prison system knows that. In 1994, three years after Whitemore opened, the SSU held a total of five men who'd been jailed as IRA terrorists. Generally, the thing that struck me most about the IRA was their discipline. They would have a rank structure in jail, just as they had a rank structure in the IRA as an entity in Northern Ireland. The IRA tended to keep to themselves. They wouldn't really get involved in prison politics. Uh, so like the everyday running in the wing, they, they were kind of aloof, if you know what I mean. They would talk to you, they weren't unfriendly. And there was certainly a level of formality in the way they would deal with prison staff. Um, if they had any issues, complaints, they wouldn't deal with the landing officers like other prisoners did. They would want to take it straight to a senior officer or straight to a wing governor. But their good Why waste time? behaviour was masking a long-running secret plot that would... Why waste time with the, with the uh, employees? Or you can go straight to the, you know what I'm saying? The owner. Rock Whitemore to its core. The very moment they arrived at Whitemore, they were already planning a way of trying to escape. They befriended a fellow inmate, another notorious escape artist called Andy Russell, the man who'd hijacked the helicopter that landed inside HMP Gartry in 1987, and who was currently doing time for it. Andy Russell. I know I've seen um, another one of these where the IRA escaped but they fully escaped. Who had already been involved in escapes. Almost. You know he's going to be game fit, so they've brought him along. Obviously, if he tried to escape from other prisons as well, he was always trying it. Forced the pilot to land and picked up the two guys and, and, and got them away. That One of them was out for 18 months. With Russell teamed up with the five men jailed as IRA terrorists, they began to devise a plan. They're trained to look at every aspect of a prison and use it to your advantage. So these guys are plotting all the time. That's why they're in the unit. But then they've realized in the unit, they can suddenly manipulate people. They schemed in secret, smuggled in parts, and built the necessary tools they'd need while successfully distracting the unit's prison guards who had no cause for concern. You have, in a way, a rather strange standoff between prison officers who have become quite relaxed around their secure inmates and inmates who are all the time planning quietly, subtly, to stage an extraordinary prison break. Uh, that's the difference. You know what I'm saying? When they in jail and they're in prison, they got all day to think about how to get out. 24 hours, seven days a week. Prison guard, after they eight hour shift, they going home to relax, eat Sunday roast. You know what I'm saying? Eat peas and mash, bangers and mash. They done. What's up? And they only thinking about the job that eight hours that they there. They bullied and intimidated them. They started to hang sheets up in the association rooms and in the hobbies room to stop staff seeing what was going on. And staff would pop their heads in and they'd, they'd harangue the staff, what are you doing? This is no, this is our area, keep out. They groomed them, if you like. And they would listen? To think that they weren't dangerous and they weren't any problem and they weren't going to be any problem. Having taken care of the staff, the six inmates were able to finish constructing the equipment needed for their unbelievable escape attempt. Volleyball poles, and then they've got the knuckles that you put on the ends of Olympic bars to hold weights on. They use them to brace the two poles together, a rope through the centre of it with little slats of wood through it, and they used to climb up. They used the poles to put the ladder up onto the wall. They went to elaborate lengths and they assembled an extraordinary amount of equipment. The prisoners then managed to convince staff that they were being monitored too closely. But in the unit, what they had done was they had complained that the cameras were watching them all the time, so that the screws went, oh, all right, we moved the camera over this side, but it will be facing there. So that 
That's what I'm talking about. Incompetent workers. I already knew that that was going to be an issue with this whole this whole prison. And, and look, they in the SSU unit talking about they getting too monitored too closely. That's what the point of the unit is for. Y'all going to move the cameras? Like, yo, wow. Yeah. Let's say they managed to get out of the unit unobserved. They even protested to officers about the stringent search methods so that visitors went unchecked. The IRA prisoners were pressuring staff and were pressuring the um, the management of Whitemore to relax the regime to the point where even their visitors were coming in jail without getting proper searches. And the IRA, they took advantage of that. They managed to get a, a firearm smuggled into the actual unit. They got a blick? I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's funny to me. I, I don't know. They got a whole pium pium into the SSU unit of the newest and most securest prison in Europe. Under the cover of darkness, the gang cut through the first fence. But as they encountered the second fence, they set off the tremor alarms alerting staff. And then they got to the uh, wall and they managed to get over the wall. One, um, I think one prison officer was shot inside the prison. A bullet reflected off the floor and hit him in the bed. He didn't penetrate, bruised him. Once over the outer wall, they were on the run, closely followed by the prison's guard dog patrol. And when they let them were on the run, penetrate, bruised him. Once over the... <laughs> you see bro right here? He almost broke his whole body. The outer wall, they were on the run, closely followed by the prison's guard dog patrol. And when they let the dogs off, the lads were throwing pepper into their faces. Dogs start sniffing up the pepper. They're not chasing them now. They start attacking the screws because they're confused. With the officers fully aware that the escapees have firearms, they follow at a distance as the men run towards a disused railway line. Their idea was to disperse into the fence so they'd be harder to find. Took um, the police helicopter and um, some heat detection equipment to identify where, where they were. After a two-hour search, all six men were recaptured and the prison staff returned them to their cells in the SSU. It's embarrassing. An escape of this caliber from an SSU is going to make people's heart beat very fast in no, the prison system. Very fast. I'm talking 97,000 beats a minute. Got a good eye in the course, some of them, when they got back. Um, they all had black eyes and bruises and such. But they got good. I didn't get them climbing over the walls, did they? I think they took the case to the European Court of Human Rights about three or four years later. It got there and they were awarded payouts for the damage that had been done to them by the prison system. Whitemore's reputation as the escape-proof prison had oh. been completely shattered. The attempted escape was humiliating for the prison and the entire criminal justice system. The next day, Home Secretary Michael Howard called for an official inquiry. The escape was well planned and well executed and it's it caused a lot of political embarrassment. And around prisons, people were cheering in their cells when they heard the news on the radio. The findings of the Woodcock Inquiry report were damning, with staff and the prison service being criticised throughout. In of course, it's going to always come down to staff. It don't matter what 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 you got going on to keep prisoners in within that prison it's the staff that's gonna make it possible mentioned that the prison escape attempt was always a disaster waiting to happen and that everything which could have gone wrong has in fact done so as a result of the escape and the inquiry into it the ssu at whitemore was immediately closed down and a tidal wave of change swept over the whole prison service when that report came out, the whole system changed. It was unbelievable. The whole system from category A dispersal prisons to open prisons became locked down. We just suffered for it after that. From then on, it was just suffering because of what they did. And prison just became a lot harder. Security was hastily tightened to previously unheard of levels based on 64 recommendations outlined in the report. Eventually, HMP Whitemore's SSU 
reopened stronger than ever. Newly arriving inmates would find themselves confronted by a regime stricter than ever before. And I think it was the fight in me that kept me going. Because a lot of people string themselves up, self-harm, take drugs. My was, I took the battle to them. Whitemore was designed to be Britain's most escape-proof prison. But after an audacious IRA getaway attempt, its shattered reputation needed to be rebuilt. The SSU, a special security unit for the most dangerous and... Can't even really rebuild after that. You're supposed to be undefeated. <laughs> you out here 1-0. and oh. I mean, 0-1. Oh disruptive prisoners in the system was reopened with even stricter routines and higher levels of security. It installs fear. It filters like a ripple system. White more, white more. Less than a year after the infamous escape attempt, Category A inmate Kevin Lane arrived at Whitemore's SSU from HMP Wormwood Scrubs. He had a fearsome reputation for violent conduct. They treat everybody differently. If you turned up with a bad rep, like I did, Lane is violent, um, he will hit you if he says he's going to hit you. And if you ain't strong, you won't be at the top of the chain. It's the known contract. If you assault a prison officer, prison officers are then going to assault you. There is no two ways about it. You oh, are going yeah. to get brutally beaten. Oh, yeah. Known as Lights Out Lane as a teenager for his brutal fists, the boxer, an ex-bouncer, was handed a life sentence in 1995, having been convicted of shooting 44-year-old businessman Robert McGill. Kevin Lane was 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 one of the good guys in Whitemore, actually. He was a nice fella. He was a great fighter, Kevin, a great boxer. Lane was accused of being a professional hitman who was paid up to £100,000 for a contract hit on McGill. But Lane denied the charge, insisting it was based on one piece of forensic evidence found in a car he'd borrowed from a friend days before. It was well known that Kevin didn't commit the crime he was in for amongst prisoners. Everyone knew that. I mean, I think most of the screws knew it as well. When arriving at Whitemore, the last place you want to be heading to is its reopened special security unit. Sterile. You're locked in a tomb. And a metal table fixed to the floor. Metal seat fixed to the floor. Stainless steel toilet, no seat. It's very, very daunting. New security measures in the SSU meant more frequent inmate checks by its officers. I was checked in my cell every 20 minutes. I thought I had a bleeding tick 16 years later when I came off the cut. I was forever doing that. And there's no bugger there at the door. That's because you're checking. Someone looks at you, you look at them. Are they coming in on me? Why are they checking? And that's what goes on. Torment. Terrible torment. I used to say, I won't be beat. You are not going to beat me. I won't have it, and I'm going to keep going. And I think it was the fight in me that kept me going. Because a lot of people string themselves up, self-harm, take drugs. My was, I took the battle to them, and it kept me going. Locked up in the SSU, you were expected to conform at all times or suffer the consequences. If you step out of line in the SSU, you can expect violence, and plenty of it. The doors had, 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 had chub padlocks on and deadbolts, so they had to take the padlock off, then go to an intercom in a control centre and ask for that cell to be opened. As the door opened, I ran and met him, kicked the bottom of the shield down. I had some boxes in the way so they couldn't get through with the shield. They're hitting me with their truncheons and they're punching me. The eye split. Couldn't see out of it, it was split like a melon. If you stepped out of line in the SSU, you were taken to his isolation sound, block, known by inmates. Sound like he started it to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, no offense, you know what I'm saying? He said he will not be broken. He was checking, he just wanted to get even, or he just wanted to, you know, feel like he had some type of power. And, you know, you they walked in on you. You can kick the shield like it's up. You knew. You knew. You knew that there was a problem if you got out of line. And you just decided to, you know what I'm saying, play with that line. Mm -hmm. 
as the box. You're placed in there naked. They might give you a bib and a brace and a blanket, but normally I've never had them. Isolation in the unit is isolation. You are on your own. There was a parapet wall. Uh, YouTube, that was blurred out. Like, I, I know y'all All in a perspex window, quite high up, of course, you couldn't jump and touch it, where the psychologist would walk around there and take notes on you about your behavior. You're laying there naked with people walking around looking at you like an animal. There's no heating in there. It's designed to make you feel cold and to make, to make you feel vulnerable by having no clothes on you, shivering alone. Ooh. I wish it had been a bit warmer. I might have given them something to write about. While in isolation, you're routinely monitored day and night. The flap will open you in bed at night and shine a torch in your face to see movement. So you've been woken up all night. It's not good. Imagine going through that week after week, month after month. Torture. Yeah, that right there, that's torture. Why do you need to wake him up? Because you're a fucking arsehole, that's why. And you need jet night and dynamite. Because you're going to sleep. That was my <laughs> approach. If your behaviour improved, you'd be taken out of the box and placed back in the SSU. And eventually, if you no longer posed a risk to staff, you'd be allowed back onto a spur but under strict supervision. To move me, they'd have to get permission from the control center. Yes, it was okay to move Lane. You can move them on the walkway or we can move them on the twos. Uh, they would tell them how I'm to be moved. And there would be an alsatian with me and members of staff. If you're on the book, so every time you move, that book gets signed by what officer you've been moved at this time, taken to that place. So you're their responsibility. Because you're searched every two weeks and move cell every two weeks. You never, never get time to settle. No matter how tight the security measures are at Whitemore, prisoners will always find ways to break the rules. And there are a few I feel like it's always, problems in prison. Most prisoners will all The scenery outside of prisons is always beautiful. You know what I'm saying? Good sunset. Good grassy plain. High, nice little trees. You know what I'm saying? It's peaceful. Look like you can frolic all in here. Always find ways to break the rules. And there are a few problems in prison more serious than the business of illegal contraband. In most prisons in this country, the biggest business going in the prison for prisoners is selling drugs. Um, because there are so many addicted prisoners in, in the system. During the 90s, I think the, the, the drug of choice was cannabis. In the afternoons, you get unlocked after dinner. I'd uh, go and do my cleaning again. When I finished, I'd go get stoned afterwards. It does kill time, so people take it for that reason and just to get away from the stress of life, full stop, behind bars. Drugs were coming in through visits, so female visitors would bring drugs in and they'd insert them into themselves and then during the process of the visit they would take the drugs out and then the prisoner would then give them a kiss, they'd put them in the mouth, they'd have a kiss and the prisoner then would swallow the drugs and then regurgitate it later on and wait for it to pass through the system. You can't search people's cavities, it's against, the, it's against prison rules. But it wasn't only from visitors that drugs like cannabis were readily available inside Whitemore believe and there was some instance that took place that the, the majority of smuggling was down to staff corruption staff were bringing stuff in for prisoners if you approach them and it goes wrong more staff issues you're in trouble so you wait for them to approach you and they do the one in white will come to me and tell me about it. his wife just divorced him and he needed money and so i went i've obliged in my time at Whitemore, a member of staff was, um, as far as we know, recruited by a drugs gang to join the prison service. He joined the prison service and he was running drugs. He was being closely monitored. Um, eventually he was caught and, and, and ended up with a custodial sentence. A member of staff that was on nights um, all of a sudden became quite cash rich. He was bringing stuff in and managing to get through the x-ray system by bringing in fresh food, particularly fish in tin foil and he was hiding drugs inside tin foil not long after opening 
by bringing fresh food in, particularly fit, what exactly was he going to do and at the job with an uncooked fish? Come on now. Whitemore succeeded in cutting down cannabis use with the introduction of mandatory drug testing. Since cannabis could remain in the body for up to a month or longer, longer. inmates were quick to look for alternatives which left less of a trace. You know, the very thing that was supposedly intended to stop the use of drugs in prison, particularly cannabis, Evolve. encourage the use of even worse drugs like heroin. People didn't want to get uh, the nickings for failing for cannabis, so most people started smoking heroin. They created their own heroin problem in prison. With heroin, it was a different monster. Harder to detect. Literally a gateway drug in prison was weed. Heroin you spread across the prison, and so did its associated problems. So if those addicted to drugs like heroin inevitably found themselves in debt, then those enforcing that debt would use violence. Chaos, chaos, more, more violence. If you ain't got heroin, you're in trouble. You're, like, you're physically rattling. If you ain't got a joint, all right, you'll be pissed off, but you know what I mean? You ain't gonna be running around robbing people for a war or that. But with everybody, it was a different monster. These are people that have just got no, um, no boundaries, no filters. These are people that will literally break every taboo in the prisoner's handbook. If you say to them, I'll give you two bags of heroin if you go over and stick a knife in that geezer's neck, they will do it, believe me. I've seen it done loads of times. Start committing sexual favours for people. So you get a habit, you can't pay it. You know, get in here and suck my cock. Bend over so I can shag you. As blunt as that. I mean, that's, that's, that's how I be in the real world. I mean, the addicts be doing whatever they can for they fix, and I'm pretty sure it's the same no matter where you at. Is and that's allegedly war it is. That's it. There's people in the prison system doing that right now. And where there are drugs in the prison system, there are drug dealers. Running most of the illegal activity behind bars in the 90s was a group of organized criminals who masterminded illicit operations on the inside, in the same way they ruled the roost on the outside. So they, they, they rule by fear. And often they've got gravitas, there's an aura about them, they're extremely confident and extremely loud. They are very, very, very dangerous, and they are feared. Possibly, none at Whitemore were more feared than Manchester's Mr. Big, gangland boss, Paul Massey. Massey. And Salford was seen by many as a Robin Hood type figure. The reality was, he was an extremely violent person. Away from the SSU, Paul Massey, you did a documentary on him before. Even though you were still banged up, life on the wings of Whitemore meant sticking to a normal prison routine. Half six, seven in the morning, you'd hear the screws come onto the wing. It's a kind of a familiar sound. You hear a lot of gates going, a lot of keys rattling. And then, sure enough, around about 8.15, they come onto the spurs and unlock everybody. You go to work, I was always housed on the wing. And those people who haven't got jobs are locked in their cells. Well, I was a cleaner. So my morning was, we'd get up, if there was early morning gym, we'd go gym, come back, have a shower, do me cleaning. You're looking about 15 steps long is what the, the, the spur was. I'd have to hoover that. That'd be my job. And someone else's job would be to clean the kitchen. My job was to clean the ground floor, empty the bins, um, and clean the showers. Uh, everyone had their own job. Cleaning the showers job, that sucks. With a bunch of men, can't get no ooh -ah. It's probably DNA all in there, like, oh, man. On the cleaners, there was about six cleaners to each spur. You'd be locked up then for an hour and a half. Um, you were let out at half past one, and the same routine again. But still suppressed, contained. You definitely know you're contained. In jail. Blimey. And contained on the open wings of Whitemore are some of the country's most violent men inside for running organized crime networks in Britain and around the world. There were Chinese guys there that had come as part of triads. Um, we got Yardy gangsters from London. We got the, the boss boys from um, South Shields, um, the Northern gangsters. We got 
um, ga uh, gangsters and um, gang lords from Manchester, from Liverpool. Michael Steele was one of a new breed of British criminals in the 1990s. Modern gangsters, more ambitious, more ruthless, and more reckless than ever before. Along with Jack Worms, the pair committed possibly the biggest gangland retribution hit in British criminal history, the assassination of the Essex boys. I can remember it vividly. This is Britain. You find three men down a track in Essex, literally assassinated. They were Patrick Tate, the leader, Tony Tucker, and Craig Rolfe. It remains one... We did several... Uh documentaries on this i remember it like yeah i remember it. part of british criminal folklore that's very hard to ignore but maybe the most reputed of the new breed of british gangsters to have spent time in whitemore was manchester's mr big the seemingly untouchable brutal gangland boss paul massey in salford was seen by many as a robin hood type figure he was involved in protection rackets. His minions would rob warehouses. The reality was he was an extremely violent person who hurt a lot of people. And people went to Paul because they needed him. He's a John Wayne of the world. I love John Wayne. He was looking after the underdog. If there was a conflict between two people, Paul try and see, try and resolve it for the better of everybody. You know, and if someone was wrong, he'd say you're wrong. Like me. Yeah, you don't flower it up. The police didn't see Massey as Robin Hood, you know. They saw him more of a Robin so-and-so. And so they put a lot of time and effort into bringing him to justice, but nobody would give evidence against him. Massey had built up a hugely lucrative business from running protection rackets and selling drugs in nightclubs. But one night, he was arrested on his own patch for attempted murder and sentenced to 14 years inside. A lot of power went to his head and he thought he was invincible. Massey's going from club to club around Manchester and he's showing off, throwing bottles at doormen and calling girls over and got into an altercation with some lads who were on a stag night from Leeds. And Paul... Stag night, that's like a bachelor party? ...stabbed one of the guys in his inner thigh. He nearly bled to death. Massey entered Whitemore's wings as a high-profile, well-known face with a reputation that preceded him. M-A-S-S-E-Y. M-A-S-S-E-Y. I wrote it down, but I spelled it wrong. In days they live in, having that sort of status is a big help because you have access to people and things that, that other people won't have access to. You might say, ask me daughter's birthday, could you uh, send her, buy her a 3,000 pound car and I'll pay you when I get out. You're a different class of prisoner. You're kind of uh, above the hoi polloi, if you like. I know this sounds all trite and, and, and crap, but that's how it is in there. Paul didn't have protection. What Paul had was notoriety and he had respect. And God, he had my respect. There was a lot of old school, school criminals in the prison system, so he'd be welcomed or they'd know your case or they'd know about it or they'd know someone who knew you. Gangsters, they've got large networks of people and they've got large amounts of power and the ability to put pressure on people. And often they've got gravitas, there's an aura about them, they're extremely confident and extremely loud and they tend to draw attention. Not all of them is loud. And not all of them draw attention. Well, yeah, they do, but they, they, that's not their fault. They just got a gravitational pull to them. ...to themselves, and they attract people in, and they are feared. They, they, they are very, very, very dangerous, and they wouldn't think twice about taking you down a back alley and shooting you in the back of the head. Even though they were banged up, these rich and powerful criminals like to keep their empires on the outside running, and that applied to Paul Massey too. I mean, by the very ne definition of the word gangster, you've got a gang outside who will be handling your business. And normally it's business as usual. If you're, uh, say, pr taking protection money off a load of different people, when you go in jail, that doesn't stop. He needs people that he can trust. To the, they still gotta eat. To keep his businesses going, that are gonna keep his family in the lifestyle that they've become accustomed to. 
in that respect, they're no different to me and you. And if a gangster's illegal business was still running on the outside, it would inevitably find its way inside as well. The only um, way you're going to be able to run a business in a high security prison is really through your visitors. Um, it's a pass instructions through your visitors and receive um, updates and briefings, talking in code. Well, I suppose Cockney rhyming slang started off as a criminal code. You run in jail the way you run outside. If you want something done, you hire someone to do it, or you pay someone to do it, or you, you know, if it's personal, you do it yourself. But there's always plenty of willing hands to do these things. For gangsters that needed business of a violent nature to be dealt with inside the prison, the dirty work was contracted out to other willing inmates. So a lot of guys will hire themselves out as hitmen. At two gangsters, two main gangsters, uh, they're actually called runners in prison parlance. Like they might say, oh, Paul Massey's got a couple of runners over there, he'll get one of them to come over. And a runner is somebody who's like, hangs around the gangsters, is accepted by the gangsters, but does all their menial work. So if <laughs> In Chicago, we call them crash dummies. Y'all call them runners, we call them crash dummies. Just crash out for no reason. Just because. You want a cup of tea, mate? Johnny, put a tea on. Or, you know, go over to B-Wing, go out and exercise and tell so-and-so on B-Wing, blah, blah, blah. I used to do things what I'm not really proud of. There's been times when people have had issues with other people and I've resolved them in good ways and in bad ways and got paid. And now talking about it seems alien because it's like I'm a different person now. And then when I really look back into the archives, I did some some real dirt. And yeah, that's, that's how that place can get you. At Whitemore, Massey would sometimes pay runners with drugs to lay down his own brand of justice when he felt it was needed. Paul Massey heard there was someone on my spur um, who had I think he'd rape a woman and beat her with a table leg in Manchester. And because that was his manner, he felt he had to do something about it, as you do, and he couldn't get onto our spur. So he put a contract out on the guy, and they went and they proper, really proper hurt this geezer. Massey paid the inmates two bags of heroin and was never charged for the contract hit. But it was a completely different matter for his two runners. Nobody could do anything to Paul Massey. They weren't going to take him to court for that. He was a high risk category, yeah, you know what? I mean, what are they going to do? Put on an escort and everything to take him down to court because he's an accomplice in something. It's not happening. And then unfortunately, when they were nicked for uh, attempted murder on this guy, uh, they grasped Paul Massey up. Grass is a uh, Cockney rhyming slang. Uh, it's from grasshopper, meaning copper. So in the old days when a copper was approaching, they say there's a grass coming. Grasses are very useful to, to the authorities. And they're hated by prisoners, obviously, because they're a traitor to their own kind, um, which is why they're dealt with so badly in jail. Being a known grass inside would leave you just as vulnerable to inmate attacks as a paedophile or a rapist. Oh, it can come from... Definitely, definitely. A grass down there, worse inside. Hold on. from anywhere, but it's gonna come. That's a bad scenario. <laughs> because you're gonna wake up every day with that on your mind. But where it's gonna come from, that could send you mad. Massey avoided punishment on the inside and was soon released in 2007. He would later find himself becoming the target and victim of the new generation of younger gangsters with a very different code. Paul was old school. Young kids in Salford weren't interested in fighting. If you annoyed them, if you, you know, did the wrong thing, they'd shoot you. Simple as. With Massey trying to reinstate his authority as Mr. Big in the Manchester underworld, he ordered a hit on a man named Mark Fellows for selling drugs on his patch. Somebody went to Mark Fellows' door with a gun to shoot him because it was alleged he was selling drugs on Paul Massey's patch and the guy pulled a gun out on Mark's doorstep 
He didn't fire. Mark shut the door. After discovering that it was Massey behind his attempted slaying, Mark Fellows decided to retaliate with his own assassination attempt. Mark's panicking, thinking, this guy's going to kill me. He's I, I remember this. And do this to me. So he stupidly thinks, I'll get him first. Paul's come home, parks his car, Mark sees him, runs across the road, out and fires with a machine gun. He didn't believe he yeah, had a choice. I remember this. It, it was either him dying or Paul Massey dying. Him go to a grave or him go to prison for the rest of his life. So he chose the latter. Fellows would later find himself in Whitemore, sentenced to a whole life term as a marked man. He encountered another gangster, that sucks. this time from Liverpool and Knowlesley, called Kieran Blair. And not long after Fellows arrived in Whitemore, he's attacked by Blair, who slashes him across the face. Dang. In revenge, supposedly, for the killing of Paul Massey. Liverpool they slashed him. Where? I hope they do it again. Not condoning violence, but they've took away a man from his children. So there are obviously people loyal to Paul who have issues with Mark. But there'd be a lot of people in the system that had a lot of respect for Paul and liked him a lot and are from his area. That's where that fellow has problems. HMP Whitemore is teeming with notorious gangsters, but they're joined by another group of British criminals banged up for life, armed robbers. I had two trials at the Old Bay. The first trial, they couldn't agree. Uh, second trial, found me guilty within 15 minutes. And I was sentenced to eight life sentences. Damn. On the wings of Whitemore, yeah, you'll be damn. living amongst gangsters, murderers. Uh, second trial, found me guilty within 15 minutes. And I was sentenced to eight life sentences. On the wings of Whitemore, you'll be living amongst gangsters, murderers, drug addicts, and armed robbers, and you'll quickly get to know your place. In every form of life, there's an hierarchy. Prison's no different. Armed robbery is considered the sort of creme de la creme of crime. Uh, you're doing, you're risking big stakes for big money. It's as simple as that. They tended to be a very, very close knit circle, almost like a family. Whitemore has locked up men who've been involved in high profile robberies including two of the Millennium Dome robbers, Billy Cockrum and Aldo Chirocci. The gang broke through the perimeter fence of the complex in a JCB digger, drove it right up to the side of the dome itself and smashed through a section of wall made of glass and metal. They were like the James Bonds of, of the robbery world, if you like. They had the ideas and tried to get away with the biggest jewel robbery that had ever been known. But the police I still haven't been able to watch this. The Millennium Dome Heist. I think I have one with Rose Kemp cut where Rose Kemp covered it. And I think that's the one that I'm probably going to watch finally. It's probably Sunday. I'm going to watch that. It's going to be out Sunday. ...have been tipped off and were waiting for the gang. More than 100 officers, many of them armed, laid the trap. Convictions for armed robbery carried some of the heaviest sentences in the criminal justice system. I committed my first crimes back in the 1970s as a juvenile and I became uh, a career criminal. Smith had spent years in and out of prison for armed robbery and firearms offences, but there was one conviction which would culminate in him receiving an eye-watering sentence. I'd already served the previous sentence, a 19 year sentence, and I got done for a, a, a set of robberies called the Laughing Bank Robbers robberies. And it, they were called that because we robbed the bank on Christmas Eve and wore Santa hats over our ski masks. So I was the only one arrested out of the whole gang. And um, I was put in jail. Uh, the evidence piled up against me. They had loads of photographs uh, of me in a ski mask. Um, so you couldn't tell it was me, but they had one of my face. I had two trials at the Old Bailey. The first trial, they couldn't agree. Uh, second trial found me guilty within 15 minutes. And I was sentenced to eight life sentences. Smith received eight life sentences for a robbery is crazy. Received his huge sentence in 1998 at the age of 38 as part of the government's two strike life act policy implemented oh. in 1997. 
All of your previous convictions were classed as one strike. And uh, if you committed another crime of violence or robbery, then that was your two strike and you would automatically get a life sentence. So I was given eight. Oh, it's not even three strikes? They, they two striking you? What game they playing? That ain't even fair. Well, I mean, if we measure it in gaming, but that's tough. Life sentences, you would automatically get a life sentence. So I was given eight life sentences. Um, eight lots of 10 years imprisonment for um, possession of firearms concurrent. I said to my QC, do you think I'll ever get out of this sentence? And he said, you got to get used to it. This is your life now. Even though Smith was a fearsome criminal, he was also a devoted family man with a wife and children, all of which he would have to leave behind. You are always expected every time you go to prison for your relationship to break up. Robert De Niro said it perfectly in Heat in the film Heat. If you're not ready to drop everything at a moment's notice and just piss off, don't be a criminal. I have to be honest, I did enjoy committing armed robberies. It was, it was a buzz. That's probably why I never really got involved in Class A drugs, because I could never get the same height. Inevitably, when you're staring down the barrel of eight life sentences, the future can look bleak from inside. Prisons are designed to break you mentally, physically, and spiritually. I didn't have visits in prison for years because I couldn't stand having visits from people I knew and then going back to a prison cell. So I cut off everybody in the outside and pretend that they didn't exist. And that's what you've got to do in prisons. Being accepted in prison by your own kind is paramount to serving a long stint inside. There was a lot of guys who were serious professional criminals. Um, who were in Whitemore, who were armed robbers. And yeah, what you do when you're in that, that, kind of, uh, that kind of company is you all gravitate towards each other, robbers, that's the thing. Because it's like, uh, it's like an A to Z of information. Yeah, yeah, that's what I always say when a prison, like you put robbers with robbers, they're just gonna learn from each other's mistake and evolve. <laughs> they really tend to talk about the crimes they've committed and the crimes they're gonna commit. And that's what we did. If no one knows you, then what we say in prison is, there's a smell about him. That means nobody knows who he is, nobody knows where he's been. So when you're coming into a Category A prison, if you don't know anybody in this Category A prison, you become a suspect. Whether you're a known or unknown entity in a place like Whitemore, being locked up 24 seven with the prison's most serious criminals can sometimes take a turn for the worse. You all pushed in together in these small spaces, seeing the same people every day and gossip and backbiting is a real problem because it only takes someone to, uh, to say that you've informed or that you're dodgy and that gets the whole wing on it and next thing you know you're being beaten to death in your cell. Gossip on the wings can lead to problems with inmates' mental health. There's a lot of paranoia and there's a lot of really deep thinking about the situation you're in. I was a paranoid wreck for about five or six years. I became so paranoid when I heard someone talking out the window I had to turn my radio off and listen to hear what they were saying to make sure it wasn't about me. Someone might not say good morning. Turn my radio off and listen to hear what they were saying to make sure. I ain't gonna lie, he got a W snack selection back here. He got digestives. He got the biggest bag of Tetley tea I ever seen. I thought this was a bag of dog food. This is Tetley tea right here. That's tough. Refresh. What else he got? Uh, sardines, two bowls. It's tough. Sure, it wasn't about me. Someone might not say good morning to you, and you might go back to your cell. And I've done it, and think, why didn't he say good morning to me? I'm going to have to take him out before he gets me. One guaranteed way of sparking the rumor mill into high alert was the arrival of a priest on the wings. I was coming back from tea one night at the up late with a big Geordie mate of mine, Bud. Uh, we see a, a, a priest down the end of the landing and I went, whoa, someone's in with some bad news. And he went, yeah. And then when I got further up, I realized he was waiting for me. And it turned out my 19 year old son had died outside in mysterious circumstances. And, um, that's got to break you as a man. Your, your, your family members get to dying and you can't do nothing. I, I was devastated. You are in a 
an environment where everything is expedited, uh, magnified, your emotions are magnified. It's all pressure, pressure, pressure. And Noel wasn't in a good place. Inmates were allowed to attend relatives' funerals outside of the prison and under heavy guard. One of the security staff, I'd known him quite a while. I was, um, I broke his mate's jaw when we were in Rochester Ballstall many years ago. And now he was like high up in security in white He didn't like me, I didn't like him. And what they'd done basically, I went in, I had to go and make an application to speak to the governor to ask for, to be allowed to go to my son's funeral. And uh, they made me beg. And in the end, they said no, and took great delight in it. Noel was going to do something extremely serious. Someone was going to get severely stabbed. Maybe. Kevin Lane came to me and he went, look, he said, they don't have to let you go to the funeral. He said, but I think they have to let you take you to the chapel of rest. So I went and see a screw and he said, yeah, they do. Fellow prisoners were outraged with the decision not to let Noel attend his son's funeral. There was a lot of discussions about kicking off, wrecking the wing and stuff like that. So people's emotions are running very high, especially when you see your pal in the cell breaking his arm. They come up with a plan to uh, pour washing up liquid over the floor, ring the riot bells, and when the screws come in, they were going to attack them. And the night before this, I just thought, no, I don't want that to be a, a testament to my son. And I went on and said, no, don't do it, don't do it. The next morning, Bang, they had been handcuffed with six screws uh, down to uh, South London to the chapel of rest, and I managed to see my son in his coffin. Ah, OK. It's just a, a horrible time, and I'm thinking, is this really what I've aspired to? You know, I'm in the most top security prison in Europe, surrounded by all the faces and gangsters who all know me, and, and this is the rest of my life. I'm never getting out. And I had to have a serious think about that. And, and for months, I grieved and I thought about it. And eventually, I went to him and I said, look, I need to get some sort of closure on this. The career criminal had found a tragic and heartbreaking reason to reform and was transferred to HMP Grendon. Grendon Prison was an experiment by the prison service really? to offer a therapeutic community within a prison environment. It was very brave. It was an idea that if you had difficult, violent men you and you subjected them to the right kind of psychotherapy, they could be cured. There was a lot of tears and pain in Grendon. I mean, we had we used to do this thing called psychodrama once a week where... Hold on, HMP Grendon... Yeah, you'd have five or six guys who would act out scenes from their lives and the other people would play the part. And, I dealt with my son's passing really with those guys there. They were like brothers to me. I opened up to them. I abandoned my family. I really, when I think about it now, it, I just hate myself for it, you know what I mean? I had to work on it in therapy and I feel loads of guilt over Joe. I wasn't, I wasn't there for him. If I'd have been a normal father, I'd have been there. You know what I mean? If I'd have been a normal geezer, then I wouldn't be sitting in a top security prison with eight life sentences wrapped around me ass when my son was outside dying. I regret nearly everything. And when I look at pictures of myself when I was younger, I just, I just so want to go back there and, 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 you know, give me a good shake up and tell me not to do the things that I've done because it was a waste of life. It really was, it really was. And if I could go back, I'd change it all. Smith was eventually released from prison in 2010. And by this time, events in Britain would herald the arrival of a new group of prisoners onto Whitemore's wings. It's become one of the places where terrorist prisoners are sent most regularly. With one inmate that would later bring carnage to the streets of London. He was a bomb weight. As Britain moved into the 21st century, its prison population would radically change once more. And nowhere more so than at HMP Whitemore. As it's developed over the years, it's become one of the places where terrorist prisoners are sent most regularly. Whitemore is constantly evolving. And those rather 90s concepts of gangsters is ebbing away to be replaced by a different form of criminal. The influx of terrorists to Whitemore from the early 2000s 
was a global sign of the times and a new approach was needed to combat this extremism. The staff feared they were losing control because of the influence of Islamist extremism and people who were promoting uh, a terrorist ideology freely on the wings. And in response to that, uh, the uh, University of Cambridge was commissioned to do some research. Since then, de-radicalisation programmes have been introduced at Whitemore for those convicted of extremism offences. They provide intensive mentoring, theological and ideological advice, and are designed to help inmates to disengage from terrorism. And does that work? The Healthy Identity Intervention, or HII, is probably the mainstay of the prison services offending behaviour intervention for violent extremists. It's an untested programme, it hasn't been properly accredited. And what I've heard from people who've been in the program, and, and this is you know, uh, supported by okay. other evidence um, that's in the media, is that these programs are extremely easy to game. In other words, it's very easy to pass the program. That's what I see, that's the exact thing that I thought when I heard it, because he was like, like these are extremists that are going into this program, just making, trying to make themselves look not better. Like, okay, cool, let me go in this program, they're gonna let me out early or something, they're gonna ease up on me. Like, I would assume that this is like, e very easy to game, or a, or they use it as a, just a ploy. Just, they cap, they cap their way through it, man, just to get out. In 2010, 19-year-old Usman Khan was arrested for- 19, Jesus. What well, about 47? Terrorist offences, including conspiracy to murder. From 2012, he attended Whitemore's de-radicalisation programme. Usman Khan was born in Stoke-on-Trent, uh, the son of Pakistani immigrants. He attended school in Britain and then seemed to go to Pakistan. What exactly happened to Usman Khan in Pakistan is still a matter of conjecture. Certainly, he developed a reputation for being a radical, for being a proto-terrorist, something which he fundamentally denied. Khan completed his course and his sentence at Whitemore and was eligible for release. What happens wow. is you go through the program and you know, you're able to then progress despite the fact that you might still completely retain your terrorist affiliations and the program hasn't worked. Usman Khan was saying and doing the right things and he was talking the talk. As Capping his way through. As it were, but he was not walking the walk at all. He was a bomb waiting to go off. I thought he was about to say quite literally. I would have turned to him. Khan was released in December 2018 after serving eight did, years of a 16-year sentence. And just one year later, he would go on to cause carnage on the streets of London. In fairness to the prison, the prison had no control over him being released. At the time, the rules stated that he was at the automatic release point um, from, his, from his sentence. In November 2019, Khan attended an event in London which was celebrating the five-year anniversary of Learning Together, a study course established in British prisons like Whitemore, which brought together offenders and those in higher education. Took part, sat there quietly, and then proceeded to stab to death a young man and a young woman who were attending the conference and injure three others. There's a perversity to this. At a celebratory event for uh, graduates of the Learning Together program, he used that as his stage for some of the uh, graduates of the Learning together program he used that as his stage for some of the most horrendous terrorist violence that we have seen his victims were 23 year old Saskia Jones and Jack Merritt 25 who were university students and had been innocently sitting close to Khan and Usman Khan was shot to death by the armed City of London police Obviously. that afternoon on London Bridge and it was all what we bridge. saw was a catastrophic system failure that meant that key information was lost, opportunities were, were missed, 
in order to detect and stop his descent into murderous violence. I would have shut that, 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 whatever that course was down. In September 2020, two inmates, Brustum Ziamani and Baz Hockton, went on trial for attacking a prison guard in Whitemore earlier that year. Footage of the incident was used as evidence in court. One a convicted terrorist and another a person that he had radicalised attacked and very nearly murdered a prison officer. Are these things linked? Yes, of course they are. There's absolutely no doubt in prison evidence in court. I ain't gonna try to say nothing, but man, a lot. Of, I feel like there's a lot wrong with this, this situation right here. First of all, they they have him surrounded already. Whitemore earlier that year. He's surrounded. One's in front, one's in the back. If they chose to do something right now, you, you're out of there. Back is turned to Buddy by here. Footage of the incident was used. Back is turned to both of them. There's evidence in court. Let them both get behind him, not even checking his whereabouts. Like, I would have told them, yo, stand somewhere. Like, like. One a convicted terrorist and another a person's linked. Yes, of course they are. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. The purpose of doing so was to take him hostage, and the purpose of taking him hostage was to murder him, probably by beheading. Dang. The prison CCTV footage was used to convict the men, and both inmates were sentenced to life imprisonment for attempted murder. Professor Ian Acheson led an independent inquiry into Islamist extremism at Whitemore. He made recommendations to the government on how terrorists should be contained. One of the key recommendations that I made was the creation of separation centres. Small units which I believed needed to be created in order to incapacitate a small number of highly subversive and ideologically bulletproof offenders, Islamist extremists in the main. If you put 20 burglars in one wing, they'll all talk to each other about burglary and reinforce all the stereotypes they got about burglary. So I think they should be treated as any other prisoner, dispersed over the system the way normal prisoners are. What you have to do is make sure these people cannot continue to be able to uh, try to convert others to the cause of terrorism. Right. You get the right people around individual offenders who are uh, you know, assessed to be extremely dangerous. And you manage those people from the you know, the day they are convicted to the day that they stop being supervised in the community and you know, potentially beyond if, ne if needs be. I think that is the way forward. Since its opening in 1991, HMP Whitemore has been an ever-changing entity with a checkered history to prove it. And as the new waves of prisoners arrive and the challenges they bring in Gulf Whitemore's spurs and wings, the inmates of old are leaving the claustrophobic confines of its now 30-year-old walls behind them. Actually, leaving prison is probably one of the best feelings in the world. Yeah, I would assume. I would assume. Stepping outside that gate. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on the post notification bells. This prison's wild. I'm gone.